see the created world around you and all the beauty and majesty of nature and still wonder why this is not enough for you to trust and rest in God. You still can't understand why you struggle to believe in God in the hard times. You have heard a lot about faith in your life. Is there anything yet that can be said that would bring you a unique perspective about faith? Is there anything you still need to know that will change your understanding of faith in God and your relationship with Him? If you think you need answers to these questions, I invite you to spend some time watching this video because I believe the things said here will be significant to you. Dear friends, sisters and brothers, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope my words find you and your family safe and sound. Our last two messages were crucial for our understanding of faith according to the writer of Hebrews. We now know that we have to please God and that faith works. So the provocative question today is, what if faith doesn't work in the way that you sometimes think it does? Let's read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 12. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive at his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as that, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand of the seashore. Many people love camping. We as a family start making our camping plans during the winter when we are still looking at the snow through the window, waiting for the pleasant summer days when we can enjoy the starry nights beside a comfortable fire. Camping is awesome. Hopefully we can still enjoy a bit of summer at the end of this social isolation. Whenever I am camping, I remember that the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, the central figure in modern philosophy, said about what he called the starry heaven above us. For him, the starry sky was one of two aspects upon which he built his theory about the existence and intelligence of God. In addition to saying that the moral law within us is a sample of what God is and how he manifests himself, Kant ended up developing a philosophical, and why not say theological, thought that contemplated what scholars more recently identify as a branch of historical theology. Kant presented a comparison between the diverse human perceptions about God and his creation throughout the historical development of societies. From the earliest recorded times, we humans have gazed up at the night sky and pondered the mysteries of the universe. Depending on where and what time in history such interpretations were made, we have drawn strikingly different conclusions of what we have seen in the sky over the centuries. What does all these conversations have to do with faith, right? Well, the Bible is a great resource when it comes to looking up to the stars and considering what we are doing here. If you go to the Bible, take for instance Psalm 8, and you realize that the starry heavens are sometimes used as a jumping off point for wonder and contemplation. Or if you prefer another grand narrative, you might go to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 and also chapter 22, affirming that Abraham's family would be like the stars in heaven or like the sand on the seashore. In other words, they would be beyond counting. And this is precisely the connection made by the writer of Hebrews. If you look carefully at God's promise to Abraham, you see that the Bible's teaching on faith doesn't work in the way that at times we think it does. Let me explain this better. 
The Word of God doesn't seem to spend a significant amount of time instructing its readers on faith based on the beautiful world we live in. Yes, I know, Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. But when you read it carefully, the Bible makes it clear that to understand faith, it is much more important to hear God's promises to His people. Put it simply, the whole creation testifies there is a great God. But it is the promise of this great God that makes us understand His plans, His way of working, and His mighty hand. Creation testifies that God exists. God's promises confirm that He will be there for you. You see, the first consideration is based on reason and logic. There is no way to deny God's existence when you look at creation. The second consideration is based on relationship. There is no way to deny God's love and God's care when you look at His promises. When we understand that, we have faith in God. Take a more in-depth look at Abraham and Sarah's story and you see that they eventually understand that God is not only powerful, He is also faithful. That is, He is the God of creation. He is also the God of the covenant. The particular promise made to this one family at a time when it seemed flatly impossible was backed up by the same power which made the world. The most important thing is not that Abraham and Sarah heard a strange voice from a mysterious being speaking to them and because of the mystery they decided to believe it. No, rather they believed because they understood that God revealed Himself as the absolutely trustworthy one. This way, they were able to realize that this God was the one who could give life where there was none. And here's the point that the writer of Hebrews makes. Sarah's faith led her to believe that God would give her a child, even though she was elderly and barren. Abraham's faith led him to believe that God would give him a homeland even though he was a wandering stranger. The same unique promise blessed and transformed both of them. Moreover, though Abraham and Sarah did indeed have a son, they never came to possess for themselves the land which God promised them. Have you noticed that? All they had was the cave which Abraham bought as a burial place. For the rest, they were living on God's promise, or if you will, they were living on faith. And that is what you need to do. Faith is not a general religious attitude to life. It's not merely believing difficult or impossible things just for the sake of doing so. Instead, faith hears and understands the promise of God. Faith hears and believes that the Creator of the universe is also the Redeemer of the universe. Redemption is crucial for faith. Because if you want to learn how to live in faith, you need to know that through the strange fortunes of Abraham's family, God is working to build the city which is to come. See again verse 10. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. God promised Abraham the land and the crowning glory of the land was Jerusalem, where the temple would be built. This was Abraham's dream, a dream given by God Himself. What is the dream God has given you? Regardless of how great and beautiful or how difficult and inaccessible your dream may be, God wants to use Abraham's story to change the way you see faith. Abraham left his country because he realized that Canaan would be his. Verse 10 presents two interesting details. The word technitas signifies an architect, one who plans, calculates, and constructs a building. The word demiurgos means the governor of a people, one who forms them by institutions and laws, the framer of a political constitution. So God is both Tacnitus and Demiurgos, the maker of all the heavenly inhabitants and the planner of their citizenship in that heavenly country. He made everything and everyone. He owns all. Abraham learned to see God this way. And you have to do the same thing. Even though Abraham believed that God is the architect and governor of the whole world, 
he needed to put his faith into practice. Remember the two previous messages, faith pleases God and faith works. Abraham was quite sure of that. And you need to be sure of some things as well. First, your journey through life is a long and dangerous one. Do you want to have an idea of how dangerous it is? Picture yourself walking 400 miles across the Arabian desert 4,000 years ago. No knowledge of the way, no well-traveled path, no facilities for travelers, yes. That's real life in all its adversities. Second, believing in God often brings you into a land among strangers. Do not expect people around you to understand all the beauty and complexity of your relationship with the architect and governor of the world. It's, it's too much for them. Third, you don't live by rights, you live by faith. You have no means of obtaining possession of your dream. You have no wealth to purchase it, no armies to conquer it, no title to it which could be enforced before tribunals. However, because of faith, you live with the utmost confidence that the dream will be yours. How can you get there then? Why should you even try to live on faith? Because faith pleases God and faith works. But also because the entire transaction is, at the highest level, an act of pure confidence in God, where there is no rational basis of calculation, and where all the principles on which people commonly act would have led you to pursue a contrary course. If you want to get there, you have to trust God. He is pleased to teach you the way, the way throughout the desert up to the promised land. May our good Father in heaven bless you with peace and understanding of his word. May he give you courage and excitement to live in faith, because this will change your life. All the best to you and your family. Bye now.